So getting into Halloween month, we're going to be discussing some spooky scaries and some jumpy bumpies. This is going to be a big one for us, being that this year we finally committed to producing a pretty hefty number of videos in celebration of our favorite holiday, Halloween. We've wanted to do this for several years now, and here we go. We're kicking it into high gear, kids, so strap in. But we're not going to tackle the real scary stuff just yet. No, we'll save that for later in the month. Instead, let's examine today a type of horror that is as important as the poop your pants silly type, campy horror. With that in mind, in this video we'll be talking about Sweet Home, the 1989 horror flick directed by internationally known auteur Kiyoshi Kurosawa, who, despite the surname and the fame, has no relation to the late, great Akira Kurosawa. Some of you may know Kurosawa from his later horror pieces like Pulse and Cure, both of which we've covered on the channel, or his even more recent forays into drama like Tokyo Sonata or Bright Future. Wait a minute. We've already given this whole spiel, haven't we? Oh, that's right. We talked about Kurosawa's entire background in our Pulse video. Go on and check that one out if you're interested in delving into Kurosawa's past and how he got to Sweet Home. Skipping past all of that, though, let's get into Kurosawa's original horror project. Sweet Home was released on July 21st, 1989, with a surprisingly mixed bag of crew members. While the entire cast is Japanese and most of the crew was Japanese, one of the most notable names in the credits is that of Dick Smith. Please note that that's Dick Smith by name, not Dick Smith by trade. Smith was in charge of the special effects, which was a big deal, as he had previously worked on the Exorcist series and The Godfather. Helping with effects and makeup were also Etsuko Egawa, who had done David Lynch's adaptation of Dune and Ghostbusters, as well as Kazuhiro Tsuji, who would later do makeup on the American Ring films, as well as Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes remake. So, even if the movie is crap, it's gotta look good, right? Despite convention, though, Sweet Home wasn't just a film. Oh no. A video game bearing the same name was released for the Famicom, the Japanese equivalent of the NES, later in the year, on December 15th, 1989. Just in time for Christmas, you know? The game was kind of a big deal, especially moving into the new millennium. By the late 80s, licensed movie games were all the rage. What set Sweet Home apart from the herd was the bond between film and game. Where tons of games were produced in the wake left by a film, the Famicom game and Kurosawa's film actually had quite a bit of bearing on one another. Kurosawa was even given a designer credit on the game, while Juzo Itami, the film's producer, was credited as producer on the game as well. The video game adaptation of Sweet Home was directed by Tokuro Fujiwara, who was shown the film earlier than general audiences and given tours of the set on which it was filmed to help him better understand the aesthetic of the project, though Kurosawa told him not to worry if the projects diverged from one another. At the time, horror games were a particularly niche category, though Fujiwara was confident that they could come into their own. Fujiwara had previously helmed the Ghosts in Goblins and Bionic Commando franchises. Having worked largely with arcade cabinets, Sweet Home presented Fujiwara with the challenge of working with a home console, but as you can see by the graphics and design, he and his team still did an excellent job. But why bring up a game in a video about the film? Well, interesting story there. Sweet Home would go on to serve as the inspiration for Fujiwara's later project that further helped horror become a staple video game genre. A little something called Resident Evil. Yes, Shinji Mikami might be the name you associate with the renowned survival horror franchise, as director of the first and fourth numbered installments. But the idea for the series originated with Fujiwara wanting to take all the things he couldn't include in the original Sweet Home and adapting them with snazzy new graphics for the 3D era. Hence the similar setting, themes, visuals, and so on. The rest, of course, is history. Sweet Home might be considered more important nowadays thanks to its renewed status as a cult hit, and a necessary horror game for the Famicom. This is something facilitated by the inception of the internet and fan translation projects, bringing the game to new audiences decades after its release. Oh, and let's not forget that Fujiwara also gave us Dino Crisis. So, without Sweet Home, we wouldn't have Dino Crisis. Getting back to Kurosawa's version of Sweet Home, 
The film centers around a TV crew who have come to an unnamed town to investigate the mansion of the late Ichiro Mamiya. Mamiya was an artist whose supposed final, undiscovered art piece has been left within his estate. We are immediately introduced to our entire group, with Kazuo Hoshino, played by the late Shingo Yamashiro, who had previously been in Kinji Fukusaku's Battles Without Honor or Humanity, as the program's director. Kasuo is negotiating access to the mansion while his daughter, Amy, complains of her dad's ineffective nature to Akiko Ayakawa, the producer, and Ryo Taguchi, the cameraman. Akiko is played by Nobuko Miyamoto, the wife of producer Juzo Itami. Amy is played by Noko, a pop star of the time well known enough to be credited by her mononym. Noko was the lead singer of the popular 80s group Rebecca, which took the country by storm from 1983 until 1989, when they broke up. The film involves this ragtag group pulling up to Mamiya's mansion and delving into the estate. In short order, they uncover the final fresco, get stuck inside, and are beset by a number of different hauntings. Together, they must uncover the origins of these occurrences, sometimes with the help of a gas station attendant, Yamamura, played by producer Juzo Itami. By the climax of the narrative, they must face not only the restless spirits of the estate, but their own personal demons and hang-ups. Those familiar with Kurosawa's later work will recognize right away that Sweet Home is a relatively standard, by-the-book camp horror film. This isn't a slight against the film, mind you. It is a great movie. But there are reasons that the film turned out so different from Kurosawa's other works. In fact, we believe that Sweet Home is a valuable film thanks to its technical nature, its cultural message, and in terms of what the movie might be telling us thematically. For starters, while the film might not be 100% Kurosawa in his auteur mode, there are early elements of his style present throughout. Kurosawa said in an interview promoting his then-recent 1997 project Cure that he doesn't enjoy using close-ups. He stated that while these shots can help to detail the psychology of a character, he prefers to lend the audience an eye for the entirety of what is occurring within a setting. This way, the audience may choose to focus on what they wish. This is present as early in his career as Sweet Home, where close-ups are almost only used for shock effect, like the slight reveals of Lady Mamiya before the climax, while most of the film is instead composed of medium and long shots, allowing us to see multiple characters interacting at a single time. In terms of writing, Kurosawa mentioned in an interview with Movie.com that he is interested in portraying characters who have roadblocks in their past, which they must overcome. This theme can be seen throughout the film, in fact, unifying all of the surviving characters. Those who die throughout the film have not resolved the roadblocks of their past. Old man Yamamura clearly has some tie, no matter how tenuous, with the Mamiya estate. Asuka can't overcome her possession, even when the ghost seems to move on from her. Taguchi makes no redress for trespassing on the supposed totem warding off Lady Mamiya. On the other hand, Akiko learns how to accept her loss of a child by accepting another child. Amy learns to accept her father, and Kazuo learns to be a good father by giving his all to save Amy. Not to mention Lady Mamiya finally being reunited with her child, thus overcoming her problems. In this way, Sweet Home, despite all camp, is a tale of loss in learning to move on, whether in this life or the next. This interest in the human element is something imperative to dramatic storytelling. Well, assuming your audience is human. And Kurosawa's comes from both his history in studying sociology and his love of film. He said once that, since he had no formal training in film, he has learned most of what he knows from other films that he enjoys, from observation rather than formal teaching. While as a writer, he draws from these films and his own personal experiences. Kurosawa has stated that he is conscious of genre conventions, and that it wasn't until later in his career that he began to let go of them in order to create a more fluid sense of narrative, which helped him in a way create his unique, bleak style of horror. However, he also states that he is not interested in creating characters who can be reduced to a single motivation, a trap which he says some western filmmakers fall into. These two ideas can explain why Sweet Home is, at once, 
a very by-the-numbers 80s horror flick, even going so far as to employ several effects and makeup people who worked on two major 80s horror films, The Exorcist and Ghostbusters. Yet, how the film also contains very likable characters with a sense of depth greater than the group of hormonal teenagers that form the stereotype of the horror genre from this period. These are, as Kurosawa says is his intent, real people placed into unreal circumstances and simply allowed to be. Even if the narrative itself is fairly straightforward from beginning to end, the space of the film is uncertain, though perhaps not upon first glance. This type of confusion in the visual space, and the hinting of things off screen, is something that Kurosawa has spoken about doing in his later projects. There's this creepy statue that appears throughout Sweet Home. It seems to appear in random places, like it moves around the mansion, or as though the mansion itself is moving it. Though we think it points to the mansion itself not making logical sense. Which, in fact, would make sense. That the mansion is made to seem more enormous through disorientation of the audience. You can witness this kind of audience uncomfortability and impossible architecture in Stanley Kubrick's seminal horror film The Shining, which has been noted for how mapping the hotel in which it is set is futile in terms of logic and conventional space. This increases the unease felt by the viewer, as they recognize, consciously or not, that something is inherently wrong with the setting. A similar feeling arises in Sweet Home when you try to understand the relative location of the fresco room. A good portion of the film's scenes are shot within this room, or deal with characters who have supposedly just left this room. But whenever we see a character or a group fleeing outside, they seem to be exiting from a different area, as though the house is consistently placing them in different locations. The same can be said of the different characters' explorations of the mansion. Except when Amy explicitly tells us that she is searching the bedroom upstairs, and when Akiko and Yamamura go into the basement, we have no overt indication as to what floor any of the characters are on at any given time. Thus, we assume that they remain on the ground floor. We understand through the hell symbolism of a room of fire, and through the pragmatic placement of a furnace below the rest of the house that when Akiko looks for Amy at the climax and enters the furnace, she has descended into the bowels of the house. But as for all of the times that a character is being chased, save again when we see Amy running down some stairs, we never get a sense of where the characters are relative to one another. And this statue is a marker, in a way, of this trend, whether it was conveniently reused set dressing or it's intentionally placed to represent the watchful eye of the Lady Mamiya. It makes us as the viewer question why we've seen this statue when characters have just been traveling in all different directions for all different reasons. Admittedly, it could just be a continuity error, but we would like to imagine that it was an intentional decision. Adding to this atmosphere of unease is the back and forth throughout the film, where we are given somewhat light-hearted, almost comical scenes, like Akiko going to get gas, or the crew arriving at the mansion to begin with, which are accompanied with upbeat, silly music. You'll notice that these scenes usually involve driving the crew's car, and that they all together cease once Asuka wrecks the car and strands them at the mansion. These scenes are played against the more sinister moments of the characters being stalked and haunted by the then unrevealed Lady Mamiya, perhaps lending through their contrast a darker tint to these more horror-injected bits. We mentioned reasons that the film turned out as it did, as in plural reasons. Perhaps the largest of these is how it's hard to say just how much of Sweet Home was Kurosawa's. It's often reported that there was a bit of friction behind the scenes between Kurosawa and Juzo Itami. Even after the release, this continued. According to Midnight Eye, following the theatrical run of the film, subsequent video and TV versions were edited by Itami, with new reshot scenes and special effects. The film was officially written and directed by Kurosawa, so it's impossible to imagine, if Itami had so much control over the project as a producer, how much he changed and whether Kurosawa's version of the film would have more or less resembled his later stated intention as a filmmaker. According to rumor, Kurosawa doesn't have much respect for Sweet Home, more or less distancing himself from it for one reason or another. This is a shame, as you can really see his filmic acumen even when he was working more strictly within the bounds of a genre, and before he began working on more passion-oriented projects in a less studio-driven setting. In terms of cultural background, Kurosawa himself would later go on to work in the more traditional Japanese ghost genre, kaidan, which is a tradition stretching back to a Buddhist storytelling practice. 
Kaidan evolved and changed with new art forms, up through kabuki plays and into a modern reinterpretation through films like Ring and Juon. Kurosawa's own contribution to Kaidan came in the form of 2001's Pulse. In a typical western ghost story, a vengeful spirit seeks to harm anyone who trespasses on their haunting ground, or will actively lure people of a specific type to their doom, and the protagonist must actively battle the ghost in order to vanquish it. Kaidan, by contrast and by Kurosawa's observation, deals mostly with spirits that will appear even in otherwise mundane, everyday situations, to explain in their own way how vengeful they feel, thus leading to no open conflict on the protagonist's part. Typically, they either harm everyone, or specifically the one who wronged them, favoring with all others to simply complain in a creepy way. While kaidan tropes can be seen in Sweet Home with the general get off my lawn attitude of the mansion's haunts toward the women in the earlier parts of the film, and the fact that not much battling occurs during the climax, it might be more appropriate to call the film a Japanese spin on the more western ghost story. In this context, everyone who dares enter the mansion and disturb the spirit's rest is prone to haunting. Though admittedly, the fact that Taguchi has to desecrate a burial ground has a double-edged twinge to it in terms of being both western and Japanese. This is seen by both the links to the age-old trope of the American ghost story, where something has been constructed on a gravesite, and the Japanese tradition with the use of the marker not as a grave, but as a ward against Lady Mamiya. This is similar to an omamori, which is a protective or lucky amulet from the Shinto tradition, or an ofuda, also of Shintoism, which is a paper talisman used to ward evil spirits from homes. With respect to its message, Sweet Home has two major concepts to discuss with us, which could better help us understand the film. The first major theme of the film could lead us to view it both as a female empowerment film and a cautionary tale about the importance of family ties. Many classic horror stories are cautionary tales in their own regards. Feminist interpretation is bolstered by the fact that all men represented in the film either die, in the case of the cameraman, Taguchi, and old man Yamamura, or are already dead, in the case of the late Mamiya with the exception of Kazuo Hoshino. In his own way though, Hoshino repeatedly shows himself for being a bumbling fool and an ineffectual father. In the beginning, Emi mocks him for being a poor negotiator, who is more or less taken advantage of by the representatives of the city, who care little if any harm comes to him. In the end, Kazuo tries to fulfill the role of the hero by tragically sacrificing himself to save Emi when in fact he ultimately becomes more or less a damsel in distress to be saved by his own teenage daughter and our leading lady, Akiko. Issues can arise from this interpretation, however, with the seemingly antiquated notion that only a mother might be able to combat the ghost of the mansion, given her close tie to her deceased baby. Consider who brought up this mother-daughter bond. Yamamura warns that Akiko has no potential to defeat the Lady Mamiya, since she is not a mother he being an older man who thinks it wise to tell younger women what he believes, and ultimately perishes from pushing himself beyond his own limits. Though it is never explicitly stated, we learn during the climactic encounter with Lady Mamiya that Akiko was a mother and lost her child. She survives the proceedings of the film. This would seem to indicate the importance of motherhood in the eyes of Sweet Home. But let's not forget that Kazuo also survives, because despite his bumbling, ineffectual appearance, we see through his selfless action of trying to save Amy that he will go to any length for his child. We think that this says more about the film's view of women and families than the survival ratio of men and women, and leads to the second interpretation, that Sweet Home is ultimately a drama about family and the connections that we build with one another. The second theme is a bit more subtle, and seemingly a bit closer to Kurosawa's own experiences. When asked about his views on religion in an interview for his 2015 film, Journey to the Shore, Kurosawa said that while he is not necessarily atheist, he doesn't believe in a specific religion. He was not raised, as many Japanese citizens are not, in a single religion, instead being exposed to multiple belief systems from a young age. This concept can seem foreign to Westerners, who are often raised in the big three religions of the book, so to speak. But in Japan, there is a persistent presence of Shinto, the oldest Japanese belief system. Buddhism, and its numerous denominations, introduced and formed throughout the country over centuries. Confucianism, a pragmatic belief system following the teachings of Confucius, and Christianity. 
having only been introduced by missionaries to any significant degree in the past 500 years or so. There are other religious minorities, but these four systems constitute the majority of what a Japanese citizen will see, particularly one living in a metropolitan area with a large number of people and attending ceremonies of different faiths for different occasions. Kurosawa claims that because of these influences, he finds it difficult to imagine that, following death, there's nothing. Though in an earlier interview, Kurosawa explained that the idea of not changing at all is scary, and that this is not purely embodied by the state of death, complete non-change. This would explain the gravity which comes from the seeming oblivion of the deaths we witness in the film. We are given no indication that our heroes do continue in any capacity. Even the house is destroyed following the film, leaving Taguchi, Asuka, and Yamamura no place to haunt. It also explains the duality of belief seen in the character of Lady Mamiya, who seems to ascend to another plane after regaining her child. Before the obvious skyward-aimed heaven symbolism, her appearance is more grotesque than that of a typical western ghost, with no ties to her living appearance, her mode of death, or anything like that. Instead, she has taken on another life as she has died. She is not in the purgatory a Christian-influenced ghost story might impose on the deceased, where she is left to wander without progress. Kurosawa once explained that he enjoys the philosophical ramifications of the horror genre as they relate to the director's view of death. Though he might have distanced himself from Sweet Home, it noticeably shows his conflicting beliefs on the topic of death. Unfortunately, the film was only released in Japan on VHS and Laserdisc, just as the game was only released on the Famicom. Thus, neither piece of media has ever been officially distributed outside of Japan, with the film not even receiving a DVD or Blu-ray to date. This makes finding an English copy difficult and legally dubious. Though, if you ever get the chance to see a fan sub of the film, we highly recommend it. It might not be the most revolutionary movie you'll ever see, and it might disappoint fans of Kurosawa's later efforts, but if you can see past the relative paint-by-numbers nature of the plot itself, you'll discover a promising set of characters lush with gory special effects and striking sets and shots. As we said earlier, Sweet Home the video game is pretty important for the history of the survival horror genre, as a precursor to proper games of this type in the following decade, like Resident Evil and Silent Hill. Most notably, it influenced Resident Evil in a very direct way, with Sweet Home's director and designer acting as producer on the later project, which he originally envisioned as a means of bringing to fruition everything that he couldn't with Sweet Home and the hardware of the Famicom. Both games center around a spooky mansion, where a number of pitfalls await our protagonists. Many visual elements, like Resident Evil's iconic loading screens, were holdovers from Sweet Home. Let's not forget, when discussing the game, that Sweet Home's designer was given unbridled access to the film's sets and was even shown the film before general audiences, so that he could try and match the two projects' aesthetics. So while Resident Evil is a major departure from the original game and the film, it's notable that without the film, Resident Evil wouldn't exist as we know it today. Sweet Home is also notable for being a generally well-received licensed movie game from an era when this type of thing was usually panned. But let's also consider that the film and the game were released months apart, despite being developed simultaneously with Kiyoshi Kurosawa telling the game developer to diverge as much as he wanted from the plot of the film. And diverge it does. Let's jump into that, shall we? Right off the bat, the game follows the typical NES-era trope of simply throwing you into the mix. No introduction like the film, we're just at the mansion, and then we're inside. In keeping with the film, though, our four-player characters are the same as the main characters within Kurosawa's story. Our heroes enter the mansion, and are immediately trapped inside something fans of Resident Evil will immediately latch onto. Our first major difference from the film appears in this opening sequence, with the Lady Mamiya, our main antagonist for both projects, making an appearance from the beginning. In the film, one of the characters, Taguchi, had to desecrate a totem warding off evil spirits in order to have the Lady Mamiya appear. While the first half hour or so of the film is just filled with mind tricks, exposition, and false scares. For that portion of the film, the characters go back and forth on whether or not the mansion is haunted at all. In the game, though, she's there from the get-go. 
and there's no question as to whether there is a supernatural element afoot in the mansion. So, as a group of four people is likely to do when they're trapped in a mansion with an angry ghost, their goal is to find an exit. All the while, they encounter puzzles, fight enemies, and get backstory while characters are separated and rejoin one another. This means that the player can switch between characters for the sake of puzzle solving from multiple angles, something the Resident Evil series would explore itself more than 10 years later with Resident Evil Zero. But what type of game even is this anyway? Sure, survival horror, at least back in the 90s and 2000s, dealt with puzzle solving, but you might have noticed we've been showing some footage of the combat here, which diverges from what one would expect of the genre. Resident Evil style combat is not exactly something the NES might have been conducive to when you consider how limited its power was compared to the PlayStation. How they got around this was by using an RPG style combat system a first-person style more akin to Mother or its sequel Earthbound, rather than the side view like Final Fantasy. You even have the weapons for each character being made of various materials, like rune, silver, and so on, which is an RPG staple. In working with these RPG elements, the supernatural bits which we mentioned before get turned up to 11 as the game continues. In the film, most of the haunts involve characters being directly affected by Lady Mamiya. Here, however, since there's combat, there needs to be more diversity. There are zombies, wisps, skulls, bats, worms, zombie dogs, ghouls, the list goes on and on. So Sweet Home ends up being this weird freak hybrid game that's somewhat of a puzzle adventure, sort of an RPG, and something like a narrative horror game, which was not something that was super prevalent at the time. There are even some proto quick time events, something that wouldn't really take off for another 10 or 15 years, with titles like Shenmue, Resident Evil 4, and God of War. In a lot of ways, even if its various parts aren't necessarily the most polished compared to how they could be used later on, Sweet Home was super ahead of its time. The narrative of the game is told through a backstory that the player never directly observes, but which is explained through a series of notes left behind by previous inhabitants of the mansion. Again, Resident Evil right here. It's a tradition that has even outlasted many of the other elements of the Resident Evil formula that have been dropped even appearing in the most recent entry, Resident Evil 7. It was a smart move all this time ago, both providing context for the events of the game without having to actually show this backstory on screen, and giving players a sense that what is happening in this world is larger than what they're directly encountering. There are certain visual callbacks to the film, though they're mostly recontextualized, just like the characters and the scenario itself. There's a man that the party encounters early on, whose body has been severed at the waist, similar to how we see Taguchi die in the film. In the beginning of the movie, there's a bit where the group has to find the mansion's generator to restore power, where, in that context, it is used to slightly demystify the mansion, providing false comfort to the characters and the audience. It is here used as a game plot point that the player doesn't come across for a little while, in which they need to complete in order to progress. In the film, the whole reason the characters have come to the mansion is to find a mythical undiscovered fresco painted by Sir Mamiya, the head of the house. Once they find the lost fresco, one of the characters uses a vacuum to take away the dust from its surface. In the game, the fresco is copied and pasted all over the mansion, while one of the characters carries a vacuum in order to uncover each of these frescoes. These pieces of art each reveal a different note left by Sir Mamiya, which gradually reveal the story, as noted previously. The backstory about Lady Mamiya killing her child and others from the surrounding area is left intact, but it's revealed through these notes rather than by old man Yamamura, the film's gas station attendant. The marker that Taguchi desecrates accidentally when trying to enter the mansion initially in the film is present in the game, but it's used as a plot point similar to the generator, where the characters have to intentionally dig under it to find a key for the basement, again removing the need for Yamamura to guide the group below the house as he does in the film. In the game, it's not until they get down to the basement that they meet Yamamura, who is here another man who got himself trapped, rather than someone who came to help the group as he did in the film. Ultimately though, he meets the same fate, having his face melt off after helping the group progress. Later on, we learn that several servants of the Mamiyas are still present deep inside the mansion. In the film, the area has been vacated for some time, 
but here, these servants have continued living, knowing that Lady Mamiya has maintained control over the property after killing herself. The projector that Emmy finds early in the film is present in the game as well, this time towards the climax of the narrative, and used as a means of showing the player how to progress, rather than offering her a simple scare. This, of course, means that the game goes far beyond the basement where the climax of the film takes place, going as far as taking us to a friggin' dungeon with actual ghosts other than the Lady Mamiya. This is perhaps where Resident Evil got the idea of going far beyond the main mansion, providing a false sense of claustrophobia which in turn becomes a sense that the environment is actually a lengthy gauntlet. This is another reoccurring element of the series that continues to this day. Here we also begin to see how gruesome the death scenes in the game are, something carried over to Resident Evil, but also probably why Sweet Home wasn't carried over to the US officially, given Nintendo's strict censorship guidelines, especially in the 1980s and the early 1990s. Yamamoto comes back later in the form of a ghost, which makes sense, as the game establishes that there are multiple restless spirits in the mansion. In the film, though, whenever a character dies, we're never given a clear indication as to their ultimate fate. Here, Yamamura reappears to again give the party advice. He becomes something of a plot device, like the projector or the notes of Sir Mamiya. The climax of the game, that being the fight with the Lady Mamiya, is the last major difference. In the film, Amy calms her temper by presenting her the corpse of her child. In the game, though, with no chance of fighting her, the characters present her with items they have collected over the course of the game, which all indicate the death of her child. This, however, only serves to make the Lady Mamiya grow more angry, at which point she intensifies her persona. The party continues their efforts, and ultimately they defeat her, sending her soul skyward as they do in the film. As the game closes, we get one little indicator that perhaps in the game's universe, Yamamura was in fact Ichiro Mamiya, the Lady Mamiya's husband. It's pretty fascinating to consider how similar yet different these two projects turned out, given their shared origin. And even though this is a show about film, we just wanted to take this little detour to talk about the game, given how influential it would become, despite probably seeming like a stellar oddity at the time of its release. No one else seemed to have done a comparison video that we could find, and it's worth noting when considering the film's place in the broader context of late 80s Japanese media and horror media in general. And that, dear viewers, was Sweet Home in both of its forms. We hope you enjoyed, and that maybe you even learned something new. We'd love to hear in the comments below what your take on the film and the game might be. Have you ever played the original game? Maybe you even own one of those snazzy reproduction cartridges. Maybe you're super invested and you've got a VHS of the original film. Whatever the case, thank you for watching, and be sure to stick around. We've got a lot more coming up this month.